Okay, so the new theme, the reason why I didn't run a poll is because I didn't feel like there was any choice in the matter. <laughs> I'm forcing you all to do this. We all have a severe weakness in our ability to draw environments. We can't seem to wrap our heads, heads around the basic perspective and the basic architecture and the foliage and all of that business. So I did want to force you guys to stay on, on topic with the environment uh, challenges and uh, really help kind of, instead of creating the illusion of detail, really go in and, and, and think about what kind of unit you're drawing. Are you drawing a vine? Are you drawing a leaf? Are you drawing a blade of grass? So it, it's, it's very easy throwing in a bunch of scattered detail and it just, you know, looking like it's the illusion of detail without it actually being detail. But the reason why I posted these up, um, these these drawings, is because uh, I, wanted, I wanted you guys to go in and consider every single shingle, every single shingle, every single window, all those little details here and there that really help dress up a painting, that give a painting content. So this is the content. This is that girth I was talking about and all this uh, detail here, the specificity of the objects and things you use in your drawing. Um, instead of depending on stamp brushes or depending on texture brushes to complete the detail for you. So there is a massive planning stage here when we're trying to put props together in an environment and combine them to create one large atmosphere, one, la one large environment. So this is an exercise that you have to sketch by hand um, in this method, in this style, and go in. And I know that this, the resolutions are small. I'm sorry, I couldn't find anything that was... Could someone reverse image search this one uh, for me and try to find the original because it's just so pretty? Yeah, so just stuff like this. I want you to consider what you're drawing. I want you to think about what you're drawing. It doesn't have to be this neat. Of course, it can't be against a white background like some of these are. But uh, uh, just just so much as going in and, and considering the detail is what this whole challenge is about. It's not about drawing the best version of it. It's not about um, rendering. It's not about any of that lighting and form. None of that is important right now. All that's important is using our lines to encase a symbol of an object um, and try to render it as realistically as possible with the limitation of pencil on paper. I encourage you to find some sketching pencils or sketching brushes on uh, Google and use them in your Photoshop. If you have one already, if you're not using Photoshop, just try to find one that is a little bit sketchy. Nothing too clean or, 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 or sterile, you know, something a little bit with texture in it and, and you know, life to it. And uh, just go in and try to try to work along the theme that I've assigned for you. Please don't copy what you saw in the inspirational folder. What you can copy is in the references folder. You can take some of this and, uh, and, and build on it. You can take this detail here. You can even color in some of the bricks as we see here and try to render something, plan it. And instead of going in straight in with the brushes, try to draw larger blocks. This is a block for a tree. This is a block for a house. This is the upper part of the house. The house is kind of leaning because the house is falling and creaking all the time. Um, and uh, you know, you're trying to balance it out, balance out the composition. Um, I'm definitely going to be trying something like that, a house that was once separate from the tree, but as the, as the tree grew, the house kind of twisted with the tree and it just keeps getting patched up. Um, as the tree grows. So I like the spiral spiral look here so I might go for that as well in my in my rendition. But um, this is what I invite you guys to try. Oh I love this little weird shape. It looks like a ice cream. I love that. <laughs> I might try something like that. I like these wood pillars, the rotting wood leaning on one side. Really really cool. So don't be afraid. I know there's a massive anxiety involved in putting together these pieces and having to render them instead of just scattering a bunch of random messy strokes and hoping they read. This is this is the real thing going in there and drawing the object, drawing the thing. Uh, so I hope this challenge is, is good for you guys. I hope you have fun with it. The due date is two weeks from now on the 30th of August. I'll spend only one day um, uh, critiquing them or just, you know, showcasing them. So I might not even have to critique them. They might be just amazing. But, um, yeah, critiquing them and uh, showcasing them mostly. But um, does anyone have any questions? Paper scan is absolutely acceptable. If you want to do this traditionally, you're allowed. Please read the resource pack. It has all, the, all that stuff in there. Okay. So how do you come up with backgrounds environments for your characters? That's a big question. 
Um, and it's it's the narrative, Mr. Dragon, that connects the character with their background. It's the narrative, the story. Um, ask any designer that worked with any great studio, they'll ask you, there is no character and there is no environment without a story. You can't just randomly put shit together and hope that it, you know, reads as something with, with, a, with content um, to it. So the content comes from the storyline that links the character with their background. So what is the character? What are they doing? How are they wandering through this? Are they a hunter? Or are they some kind of, um, uh, I'm not sure, like, you wouldn't put a character like uh, Ranger or, you know, the Viggo Mortensen character in Lord of the Rings. Oh, I forgot, I forgot his fucking name. Aragorn. In a city scene, you know, you wouldn't put him in a royal scene. You wouldn't put him in a royal house with, um, like, a court. You know, he'd have to be dressed up in order to fit in the court. When you want to show a character in their natural environment, you would throw Aragorn into the into the woods. You'd throw him into a you know a shadowy dark part of a of a uh, of a cavern or a tavern. Sorry. Uh, so you have to think about the narrative if you want to combine your character with their environment successfully. Where is the character doing there? What's their goal? What's their motive? Uh, what's the method? What what's their role? What's their uh, storyline? Uh, where what do they plan on doing in there? Um, and that's how you sort of combine it. It's not about, you know, grass doesn't belong here and this should be red. It's nothing technical. It's all storyline. And then the technicals come right after that. Can I use Yoda's hut as inspiration but not a reference? Yoda's hut, uh, you can use it as a reference if you want. You just can't copy other people's art. The only reason why I'm saying stuff in the inspirational folder is not... Uh, copyable is because that's other artists work and I haven't referenced them because I don't have time to find every single artist and credit them um, and soothe their egos so I, I'm just saying just as a general uh, caution don't copy them and pass them off as your own you can copy whatever's in the references and manipulate it and change it to be your own at that point you're no longer copying it's just photo referencing <clears throat> um, If it gets, if it gels nicely with the three references, you're obliged to use here. Go for it. Um, in the core reference folder, you said that we are required to use at least three of them in your final design. What does that mean? That means use three photos. Pick something out of three photos, at least three photos, in the core references folder for your final design. So choose something. I chose the brick from this photograph. I chose the grass from this photograph, and I chose the tree shape from this photograph. That's basically what I mean. <clears throat> Could someone send me a link exactly what the three thumbnails should look like? They're just three little uh, windows beside each other attempting different combinations of shapes and sizes in negative and positive space. Um, yeah, no problem. All right, so let's begin. Um, I wanted to touch on this real quick, and uh, the biggest uh, issue that I see in this is the fact that we're not really following very, very uh, carefully the form under all of this. So you drew the cube here, and you drew the cube very, very successfully here. But when you transferred it into a rock, when you gave it that rock texture, what happened is that you, as you added detail, the 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 characteristic of the rock was you know, removed. The the, I mean, the cube, sorry, the geometry was limited. So what happens is what we need to do is remember that the geometry sits under our shapes as a guide. The geometry guides our brush strokes. So don't let over blending and over detailing force you to cancel out some of these important uh, core shadows and core lights. So these are the, let me see if I can do that. So these are the, uh, the highlights right here and that, that lack of light over here. If there is light traveling over this entire rock, anything that is pigmented will also go up in the value. So this little change right here does, does a world of, of, of good for this painting. Because all we have to do is show that this rock isn't just going to as it adds detail, isn't just going to completely cancel out the law of, of the painting, which is the form. Select inverse. The law of the painting right now is governed by this cube. 
So that means that I'll use this and I'll go on lighten. So that means we just have to be careful when we throw these extra little details here, we can't just cancel out all the work we did under that. Okay. Oh, before I do that, I have to just erase the shadow here. So this side does get shadow because it's not facing the light as this part is here. But this whole section, this whole section isn't as bright as this section because they face a completely different opposite direction. So this, this section here is limited. And this area, which is a reflective rock, is not going to be exposed as, as much as, as you made it. This area right here. Okay, so let's take a look at the before and after. And this is a common problem. So isn't this isn't just me nitpicking one of your forms. This is a common problem throughout the painting, uh, the painting of these uh, pieces here. If there is a pigmentation change, it shouldn't be that much of a drop. We have the exact same problem here. So you're telling me by the fact that this is the shape of shade of the color and in, in lit by light, and this is the natural state that it's in. So typically, we would want to see a little bit more light up here. If you're sharing value words and the rock is this dark, in a light source environment, which says that you can only go to this, this dark if you're facing completely away from the light source, and that means that this only these sides are painted black, which doesn't seem rational. It doesn't seem probable. That only the dark side of every one of these pieces here, which you shaded, are, 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 are painted in. So I'm not sure what you, I, if you know what I mean by painted in, but the only way that a, an object darkens outside its local shade is by pigmentation. So that means that this wouldn't be that dark as you drew it. It wouldn't be that dark. It would be a little bit lighter. Because it seems that the only the dark side of every one of these hills is shaded wrong. And if this is the dark side of one of these minor hills, and that you've chosen this level of shadow, then why have you gone that dark in one random rock that is sharing the exact same like a material or the same chemical structure or molecular structure as every other spot. So that means you have to be consistent. If you're sharing the same material between objects, be consistent with the amount of darkness you use. So if you have two marble statues in a painting beside a character, and both those marble statues have the same value and the same color and the same uh, just substance, then it means that both of them will have the exact same level of shadow and the exact same level of light on them. They're the same material. This material doesn't just randomly change into suede halfway in. So that's one of the issues I'm seeing here is that you're not consistent with your values according to which plane is looking at the light. So yeah, you've used the cube, yeah, you're trying the cube, but we need to push the preservation of the core shadows and the, and the, and the, um, the core geometry a little bit more. So preserve the shadows found and the shadows and the lights found in the core geometry. Preserve them. So again, another example of this is this sphere right here. So half the sphere should be in shadow. Darken right here. Half the sphere should be in shadow. Just like that. And only the areas that are getting the light are areas that are, uh, you know, allowed to be that light. So just around here would be a little bit lighter. So let me get a new layer going. Select inverse. So that means that you know the slightest little little change of an angle on a rock will expose it a little bit more to the light source. And I'm not seeing many cast shadows either at all. So I'd love to see some more cast shadows. So the core geometry of this object right here was a sphere, but you shaded it through and through. 
which is a big mistake. You preserve that geometry. You don't you don't remove it. You keep it. You say, okay, if this was if it, if this was back to its original shape, if this was back to its original shape, if this was back, would this be as light as I made it, or would this be as dark as I made it? If the answer is no, then you need to go back and redraw the cube in its most basic sense, in its most basic form. And take a look what happens when we darken. So all I had to do, all I did was lighten these shadows back to their uh, local shade. And look what happened. Look at the look how void we are of any detail in areas where we overly shade. The only place we're allowed to have detail uh, removed like this is areas of shadow. Areas of shadow have less detail. Write that back to me. So that means areas of light are the exact opposite. They have more detail. So what we're missing in this entire section here is just a little bit more of that. So I'm just drawing the front planes of any of these rocks. More of that, that, that pattern here, that formation. There's light touching this entire upper side of the cube. So where is, where is all of it? Where is all the detail? And you were missing it because you used the dark side a little bit too much. There's also these little ridges that you have right here that are a really great opportunity to cast some shadows. So right along this section right here, you could have cast a nice shadow. Okay, and then this part would be the part that is just a little bit lighter than anything beneath it. Be a fraction of that. And this over here would be just another shadow. So you, you've made like this little bite, this little like cheese hole <laughs> in um, in this object. So you have to follow. The outline determines, the contours determine the outline, and the outline determines the contours. Write that back to me as well. Can anyone explain to me what I mean by the outlines determine the contours, or the contours determine the outline? Okay, so I'm just gonna... I can't go in there and detail it anymore. But uh, remember that these these areas right here, all these areas are casting shadows. All these areas are casting shadows backwards. So you should preserve this shade for only an area, only areas that have shadows. So unless this goes down like that, unless this whole area is like a crevice, um, then you should see, then you should lighten this whole area up and connect it. But if this is a valley. So let's draw some contours. If this is a valley like here, if these are all valleys, and this is like the front part, and this is just a little piece here, then you need to connect that. If this is a valley all the way through, then this whole back side would be cut out because this is a valley. There's nothing else on the other side. So you really have to make sense of the landscape of the geometry of any form structure you're, you're experimenting with. So you're experimenting terraforming here. That's what it's going to be. Terraforming is just setting up your background so that you are, so that you know exactly where the contours are. So this would be the, the canyon, and the canyon has, you know, all its contour lines are pointing down when they move down, so they're vertical lines instead of horizontal. Everything needs to be addressed like that. So this, the core geometry behind this rock is a pyramid, or, or a, yeah, a pyramid. So you have to draw the other side of each, or the, the contour lines on each side, and show that they are perpendicular to each other. So this, this contours, the, these contours are what help you detail. And the more detailed your contours, the more detailed your image will be. And then you see that the horizon line here is cut off, because there's no more, there's nothing connecting between these two canyons here, either side of the canyon and then a valley. So these, this isn't just for large scale, all of these rules aren't just for large scale landscapes. A large scale landscape, if you zoom in on a rock, it'll look like the surface of Mars. It'll look like a desert. It doesn't matter, micro or macro, it, you're still going to be um, moving in on some ridges that is, still exist on a small scale under microscope or um, just with a camera and a helicopter. It doesn't matter how what the size is basically. 
you still have to consider every little micro change. This secondary light source that you're adding in is way too soft. It's way too porcelain. The secondary light source, when it hits a really jagged edge, it, it just works the exact same way as the primary light source. It finds the planes of the cube that look at it. And that's what gets that secondary light source. It isn't just a soft light you brush over everything. You just have to make sure you're not using like this value. But you just grab one of these. And you just make sure you have like a nice old value for it. Select inverse. And you have to get rid of that fuzz because that fuzz, you get that, that softness that you have here in the secondary light source is wrong. The light source would not do this. The rock would not allow it. So the secondary light source sits on the contours, reveals detail. All light reveals detail. All right? Just because you get a soft brush and throw it on a face and you get away with it doesn't mean it works the exact same way here. So when we select inverse and then I reestablish these core shadows here that you uh, drowned in this soft light and I just get them back. When I get the secondary light source back, let me just get that. Oh, is that a shadow? When I get the secondary light source back, what I do is I just find the side of every one of these cubes just over here. And this is probably casting a shadow and this will also have a side to it and there will probably be other pieces that have sides to them. And then you throw in the fraction, a fraction of the light source gets thrown in and that would be the secondary light source. That looks terrible but you know what I mean. Okay, so all of this, all of this can be experimented with without you having the creative, the creative pressure to, you know, draw a rock or draw a tree. You can all experiment with this. Basically, in a really, really friendly um, sandbox environment, in a form study, and these are definitely form studies. But um, I would love to see you try a, a more focused study of the cube so that you don't make mistakes like these and you make them early on in your form studies. It's easier to make a mistake on a form study and get away with it than it is on something that is colored and detailed and you spend hours on. So if you're focusing the eye on the shadowed area, can you make the light areas the ones with reduced detail? Uh, if you, you should never focus your eye on the shadowed area. You see, if a photographer had the choice between taking the picture of the person that they find really interesting in a shadowy room with almost no, no exposure or an area that has moderate exposure, they're going to choose the area that allows the detail through. Uh, you want to capture this, the form. You want to show the form. The form is not possible without light. So you're never going to be in, in, a, in a position where, at least in a good position, where you're going to be uh, wanting to focus on a shadowed area. If, you, if the whole environment is a shadowed nighttime scene, it's still the same. It's just on a less bright, uh, bright spectrum. You're still going to be focusing all of that, whatever the, whatever, you can't have, you can't say I have a nighttime scene. The only time you can say I have a nighttime scene is when you do this. <laughs> Nothing is ever a nighttime scene. You're never really going to paint a nighttime scene. You're probably going to paint twilight and pretend that it's night. We need light to show us where everything is. It's just in a less bright environment. So there's still going to be a primary light source even in the nighttime scene. All right, so that's what I wanted to say for this. And this is what I mean when I say the only way something can be dark is if someone painted it in. Like for the person who drew this, unless you intended, unless you intended this rock side be this dark, um, and as if someone came in and painted only, only this side of the entire cube. Like, unless that was your intention, then this is wrong. It needs to be much lighter because the midtone and the highlight are telling a very different story about the amount of light this cube is capable of. And an object that is light is not capable of going this dark. So what we need to do is just raise this up just a little bit. And now it looks like this object is consistently gray. It's not just dark only in one side. And this is especially problematic when students try to shift over from grayscale into color. They end up painting with really, really dark values and wonder why their skin tones and why their objects look muddy. And that's because you're going too dark too soon for the local color on that object who is, that is generally very light. All right. 
And please remember that when you're adding detail, don't just get a random ass little brush like this and like this is something I used to do a lot, all right? Don't just don't just do don't just do that. Let me let me show you the true majesty of this brush. Oh shit, deselect. All right. Don't just don't just go around doing this. Oh yeah, I have a rock now. Oh yeah, baby. I was just let me just completely just, you know, let some of it through. No, this is wrong. You can't use this. This is a micro texture that is forgivable if you really just want to push the texture that far. And it's a stamp brush. You're stamping in detail. If you want to paint in detail, goddamn. If you want to paint in detail, you know, you have to show it. So if you're trying to show a crack in the surface here, but it's a really, really small little fissure, you have to draw it in. Unfortunately, that's what's expected of you. You have to draw in those little details. Again, if you're drawing a scar on someone, so I chose this value and threw it there. I'm going to make it just a little bit lighter. And I'll choose this value and throw it there. So you kind of just inverse the values uh, when you're trying to throw a crack in between two, um, you know, two sides of the cube. But yeah, typically this is, this is just what we do. We have to just draw them in. If they are ridges, if they're some kind of like the side here, is a ridge just like that. Let me see if I can get away with no. Okay. So I really have to think about my lasso now. <laughs> I can't just half ass it. Uh, the top of this would be bright or a little bit dark, sorry. And then, yeah. And then the dark and the side, like the bit on the side would be the dark bit. And then we'd go back to that value again. So we're painting in every individual little break and we're representing it by the outline. So the outline guides the contours and the contours guide the outline. So the outline is this line and the contour is that line times whatever all across the surface of the face. So if you want to paint in those tiny little details, you have to go in and sculpt them. You have to sculpt the details. Sculpt the details. Write that back to me. Okay. So don't just throw in random little cracks here and there. Every one of these little high points has a shadow beside it. Every single one of these high points deserves a little shadow behind it, beside it, because it has a, it has a, there's a reason why it's getting that light. It's sticking out. And unless it's pigmentation, unless it's like a chalk, like some sort of chalk mess, like paint, again, it's only if it's painted in. And you have this little break here that, again, the outline has to represent the contours. So this little break here deserves that little bit. There's probably a little bit of secondary light source as well. Okay, so I see these little, these little, I'm nitpicking, I know, but it's, it, that's what you have to do. You have to learn how to render while using form studies. Form studies teach you how to render. What I'm doing right now to this rock is I'm, and I'm rendering it. I'm giving it some detail. I'm giving it some structure. And the other side of this rock as well will get a little bit more light. <clears throat> Just like that. Okay, and that's probably going to continue up. So you go in there and you render every one of these little pieces. Everything gets considered. And eventually it just tapers off. just like that. So render the detail. Um, this I probably would need a reference for it. I think it's some sort of rock, some sort of um, like a gem or a rock or something like that. But uh, preserve your core shadows that you pick up off your, off your uh, you know, whatever the core geometry is that's guiding you around these objects. Make sure you have them. You'll have more pronounced form this way. And always remember that the background has to be a certain kind of light in order for the form to make sense. Because if the light environment isn't light enough, but you're showing that the objects are reaching a really, really high state, then that means the light environment was, uh, you know, brighter than what you painted it as in the background. So it might be just a little bit brighter for this rock, for this rock. Look how bright it reaches. This one actually it deserves a lower one probably even darker, this one here. 
Um, this one here needs a little bit, this is one that's actually probably good for this one. It just needs a little bit more light at the top. Um, but it might be even better if it was a little bit lighter as well. So each, each one of these is from a different light environment. That's why I'm changing the background back and forth. So always keep that in mind for your form studies. Yes? Okay. So this is, um, these are two examples right here of uh, bad camera work. So when you're, when you, let's say you're walking through the snow and it's really stormy and you're walking and you're a magician and you're looking for this guy who has a secret to something but he's known to be like, you know, he kills anyone he sees and he wants to be left alone, a minotaur type recluse monster that is sentient and, you know, you can have a conversation with it. And the first time you see him, you probably run away, you're scared shitless and you go back to the tavern and you go to your buddies and you say, yo, man, I saw this guy, he was really big. You're going to exaggerate. You're going to fucking exaggerate when you see a weird yeti looking ass guy traveling at you at probably 40 miles an hour in the middle of a snowstorm. You're going to be freaked the fuck out. You're going to go back and describe him to be really big, really fast, really ferocious. Probably, you know, his hand alone could have just ripped you in half. His 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 hand, his, his, his arms are the width of tree trunks exactly as you drew them. So if I was a cameraman and I was listening to him... I, and, and if, if, if I was a, you know, if I was just any, any person really listening to him, I would see this guy as towering over this little dude here. But right now they're standing beside each other almost as if it's a character design lineup. So character design lineups, no matter big and small, they sit on the same line. So that you can see the reference of large characters in comparison to the sh smaller characters. This guides um, animators and comic book artists around making sure that everything stays in scale. So when you have them almost in the exact same, first of all, they're both in the exact same plane. They're both on the same plane right here. They're on the same horizontal line. I don't know how they've balanced themselves, but they're not falling over. They're, they're, they're doing a dance right here. It's a tango. It's a salsa. <laughs> and they're sharing the exact same, same plane. This guy here does not feel menacing at all. I'm not scared of him at all. In fact, it's almost comical seeing one massive dude stand beside a tiny dude. All right, it's, it's really funny because you're just like, you know, the, the contrast of the sizes is just uh, really funny. That's, you know, that's used a lot in, uh, you know, in all kinds of character designs and character design um, groups of characters with each other. It's just an amazing thing to do. It's like, uh, you know, that one, that one dude who makes the healthy bot, the health bot, what's it called again? Those kids that act up as superheroes. B-Max. B-Mac. I don't know. But B-Max is so big and so ridiculous looking. And everyone else is so much smaller than he is. And he's always there in the same plane as everybody else. It's funny. So again, how do we make it seem like this character is towering over him? Well, we throw ourselves in a little Dutch angle. We make sure that he towers over the, the capacity, the entire capacity of the painting. We make sure that we have a nice silhouette for him, probably in a really intimidating stance, ready to kick someone's ass, probably in some kind of lunge. He's probably, his head is really low, haunched over. He, he, his little wolverine ears you can use as a way to kind of create a dynamic or maybe even point them towards the guy. And the guy under here should be like, yo, man, I'm just your friend. I'm trying to ask you a question. I'm only Ged. I'm looking for the guy causing this crazy problem in Earthsea. I really need your help. Don't kill me, dude. And then he's like, by the power of, of, of I don't know, by the power of, of Middle Earth, <laughs> I, I command you to hear me out. I, I seek counsel. And then his cape is flying everywhere. And then um, and the light is right under this guy's crotch. But there's just enough light coming out of this beam right here revealing his light, which is exactly what you use. And the light environment is nice and cold. At this point, I'm really scared. I'm just fucking scared. While this guy is telling me his story of this crazy creep that he met, and he's, you know, he's, he's looking for the answer and whatever, and he's trying to complete his journey, this is how you do it. All right, let's just say that he put his, like, massive fists in such a way that this guy had no way to escape. And then his eyes were burning red, and, you know, the real story might have been just the guy that was, <laughs> where it was wearing a mask. But the guy who's go who goes back and tells the story, he's going to exaggerate it. So you're the artist who's exaggerating. You are the wanderer that found that crazy guy and in the middle of nowhere, and you're exaggerating what happened. All right? You always have to exaggerate. 
Yeah, Big Hero 6, thank you. You always have to exaggerate how large, how small, how tilted, how adventurous, how uh, dynamic, how, how, how uh, uh, you know, the cliffhanger experience of whatever it is you're drawing. So right here, what you did is, great job, I can go in there and talk about your color choices. I think they were great. I think I love, I love how you balance the light environment um, with the colors visible here. You did, you did amazing. But it looks like a character design lineup with a forest background. So let's say if we, you know, chose this, let's see what I can do about this right here. All right, and then this is going to look really choppy, but just for the sake of the demonstration. Demonstration, forgive me. It looks like a character design, doesn't it? You know, if, if you take away the, what's it called? These little doohickeys here. It just looks like a character design. Well, this would look cool as fuck if you just had... You know, you know, just the background in this dude, that looks badass. That looks fucking badass. Um, but if you force the background in there, at that point you have to treat the background as if it is a, you know, a storyline. You have to treat the background as if it's, it's um, you know, you're illustrating. You're forcing an illustration uh, with almost no experience with camera work. And that's what's made this character feel so small. And so uncolossal and so uncool. Alright, so does everyone understand, um, yeah, Earthsea, so does everyone understand what I'm saying? So this exact problem is over here, this bad camera work. If I was the camera guy and I was sneaking into this demonic, I don't know, pool party, and I'm, and I'm really, really scared, and I go back and I'm telling everybody, oh my god, I snuck in, I can't believe I got out, but yeah, there was this just big glowing vagina, <laughs> and they were all worshipping it, and and it was just, it was about to explode, and they had this, like, this, like, these sacrifices, and I, I swear I saw some children in there, and it was all scary. You're gonna be cowering somewhere behind this rock, so your camera is gonna be right here. And this is going to look like a little something like this, so a low horizon. You're small, so the horizon is low. And then we've got this, like, really massive, uh, in three-point perspective, fissure, you know, and, and, and it, it's got, like, this glow coming out of it, and there's, like, souls, and then you've got the demons kind of just, so the demons, I feel like, should be coming in this way and dancing and going crazy and the lava is just around so imagine you're the camera guy you the artist are the camera guy all right so please write that back to me and think about it don't just write it think about it so in order to salvage this piece i would just turn it into a, a character design this is badass this is going to sparkle in your portfolio and in order to save this one, I think what you should do is put something of interest here. So this is no longer the point of interest. Of course it's the point of interest because um, it's glowing and it's got lots and lots of contrast in it. So you have to redirect the point of interest now. You have to make it so that there's something in the foreground and there's a reason why the camera is behind up here. Maybe there's someone really big approaching these guys. Maybe it's their master. And he's like, yes, my minions, dance away, dance away. And the camera is like right behind him. All right, and then he's looking down. And maybe you can show him. You can show the demonic king on his throne looking down and laughing at his minions dancing away because we're looking through his perspective. So there he is sitting down. And then, you know, he's just chilling or maybe he's bored. And then he's like, oh, my God, these minions are so uncool. And they're, they're just so boring. They don't know how to impress me. And I'm just so bored. Right? And maybe he's got like these little horns. And he's just whatever. <clears throat> that would be cooler. But that's the way to salvage this painting. So you, it, it comes with a lesson. And it comes with an option of how to salvage it. Uh, but, um, but yeah. Keep in mind you are the camera guy. Please look up tutorials about cameras. What cameras can do to your painting. Think about it. Th look up, look up uh, you know, documentaries on, on filmography videography and filmography is that what I don't know but just try to find something that will get you into that discourse will educate you a little bit in regards to that because apparently a big massive apparently <laughs> a big massive part of being an artist is being a cameraman now that we've learned that so how do we teach ourselves this uh, and make sure that it's not a weakness in our in our um, illustration in our design in our skill set it's not a weakness. If it's a weakness, it'll show. It'll, you will not be able to fully present all of these objects um, together in the same plane in an environment.
And if you want to be illustrators, look up some camera camera work. All right, uh, you as the artist or the camera guy? Yes. Oh my God, I said babies. So, oh my gosh, I didn't even notice what I was. I thought they were sacrificing babies because I was reading Berserk last night and there was a fucking baby being sacrificed and I was so scared. But, oh my God, yeah, babies come out of vaginas too. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Maybe it's like Hell's vagina. I don't know. Uh, it looks like the heart of some evil creature and its roots are going up and these demons are going in there and they're all really scared. They look like smart Alex. For some reason, um, you know, I'm not scared out of them. It's because they're all the same size. Again, he didn't use that colossal technique. The, the camera, low camera to make something look bigger. No. No, this, this looks great. Wonderful job. I love the way you kept it yellow and didn't go into the oranges. It really feels like it's a snowstorm. Uh, but please consider the, re, you know, try this again. Try this exact uh, drawing again, but in that in that format. No. Yeah, I completely forgot that babies come out of vaginas. <laughs> yeah, I'm never having kids. Uh, yeah, Berserk, right? Yeah, so beautiful. Cinematography? No, that, uh, that's not cinematography. Cinematography is something different. It's just camera. Camera angles and camera work. Camerography. Can somebody on YouTube please comment and tell me exact terms? Studying different camera angles. I'll keep this in mind and I'll save the vagina of a house. <laughs> Okay, so it's a portal. Yeah, it looks like a portal or something like uh, looks similar to the portal in uh, Avatar. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. Sorry, it's a little bit of everything today, just really scattered. Um, but let's, I opened up Portrait Studio for this reason. So let's take a look when her cheek is fat. Look at what happens to this cheek. Let me zoom in for you guys. She's hiding jelly beans in her cheek right now. Fuck, what am I doing? Oh. Sorry, I swore. There's so many parents <laughs> who recommend, like, whose kids tell them about me. And, oh my god, if they watch my videos and all that swearing that I do, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry, parents. I, it's just, I'm so sorry. I don't have a school district over my head telling me not to swear, so it's going to happen. <clears throat> all right, so let's take a look at this cheek note. Don't look at this one. Look at this one. What's happening to this one when I do this? Oh, uh, okay, so a shadow comes in. A shadow happens out of nowhere. Let me set up the light so it's a little bit more obvious. Damn, I love her face. Okay, so again, bloom. And then we slowly, we're slowly going back down to that cheek. Okay, so what happened is, again, the contour reflects the outline and the outline reflects the contour. So this isn't, when I see this issue in your form studies, this means this issue is everywhere in your art. If you do one good thing in your form studies, it means you're going to do that one good thing in all of your art. The form study is the boiling down of all your skills, of everything that you know, stripped of all the creative glam and just, just completely boiling it down to your basic form knowledge. That's what form studies are. That's what still lifes are for. So when we're looking at this cheek, and then we look at this one, the biggest issue you had here is that you had a shadow running down here. Just look at the, if you don't see it, look at the, the, the zoom out and the navigator. It's a nice little shadow you have here across the cheek, but this one doesn't have it. So there are many reasons why in your photograph you might have read this. Makeup artists like to fake high cheekbones by contouring, which is like evil, but all we needed to do Let's just tuck her little cheek in. But this is a tiny little fix. I could have just told you. Okay, go ahead and, you know, tuck that in. But that's not that's not the lesson here. The lesson is deeper. The problem comes from a deeper issue. A problem rotating. A problem imagining contours and how they become outlines and different rotations and different degrees of rotation. So now I look at her cheeks, this massive cheek that you drew. And now I'm trying to match it with this one. It feels like it connects. It feels like it's part of the same face. It looks like a different person, it's no longer the actress, but yeah. Okay, so this Cupid's bow wasn't aligned with the nose, or with the mouth and the nose. So I'm just realigning it, and this corner here, 
This needs to be a straight line. Do not use curves for face perspectives. The, the, the curve is the wrong thing to use. The curve addresses the height of the nose as well as the flat surface of the face. The curve addresses the nose, which will not indicate to you where the inner corners of everything else is. Uh, maybe for the lips you can use a curve, but even then, why would you? Because the lips are still, they're still on the front part of the cube. So I'm just, just doing this. I'm probably going to have to tuck this cheek in, but liquify, this is a really low res, so liquify is giving me trouble. Okay. So before, do you see that? It was like she had the mumps, but only on one side. After. And this is all just from a simple, simple referencing. Just simple referencing is, is what leads you to this. This, um, you know, proportionate, anatomically correct well-formed, uh, believable human face. Just staying consistent between your outlines and your contours. Um, Alright, that's Portrait Studio. You can get it off of this Rex website. Yes, it's, it's uh, massive updates are coming up, so you guys, <laughs> if you want to grab it, you grab it now. You, you Don't wait. Please don't, <laughs> don't wait. The massive updates are going to probably boost the price up almost double. Uh, almost double. Liquify tool sush. Um, what tool is she using? Liquify, yeah. Um, you should focus on the basics, exactly. You don't need to think about that right now. Uh, exactly as Vince says, you, you, you shouldn't be worried about what how to fix it. Instead, think about what's the problem in the way you're thinking. How to fix your thinking. Her left eye is actually off. Yeah, there are a couple of other, you know, issues here and there, but my biggest issue was that because symmetry is easy to fix. It just takes mileage, but this is a deep problem rooted in some really uh, uh, problematic understanding of form. And you can see this tiny little change changed the face completely. And that was what was happening, is that we were having an inconsistency in the bone structure and the symmetry of the face. And this happens not because you don't want to have a more realistic face. You want to. Look at this. You're working towards realism. So you're definitely in there for the realism. Uh, it's happening because we're not thinking about how edges, outlines reflect contour lines. All right. So what do I mean by contour lines? These are the contour lines right here. All right. So let's draw this little one right here. This is the exact same, same shape we have over here. Alright, this line right here. So the same contour because we're, the face is it has a bump in it. And one of these bumps end, ends up being the outline. But these bumps still continue. Alright, and they also have horizontal, so... Oops. And this is the kind of stuff you see in a 3D modeling program. I tell you exactly what's what and what's where. And this is another one of those. These are the contour lines. And the contours are, they are the outlines. If we rotated her head a little bit more, this would be the outline line. If we completely rotated her head to be a side view, we would see only the side view of her face. Alright, so please remember all of these rules. Contour lines end up being the edges. So right now, no edges on, on the cheekbones. It's not through quarter view. And then we rotate it, and there they are. But we should have known, because look at the massive shadows these cheeks are, are, are expressing. This girl doesn't have fat on her face. She has really, 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 um, like a pronounced bone structure. <clears throat> okay. So any questions at all? Class is almost done, but any questions? So outlines are contours, uh, but all contours are not outlines? No, 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 no. Uh, all outlines and contours are the same thing. They're the same thing. It's just that we're seeing that one particular line of the contours in that perspective, so it becomes the outline. Or, high, or lower it, Antares. High shadow means high cheekbone. Mm -hmm. 
So to make her cheeks fuller, I should remove the shadow under the cheek, under the right cheek. Yeah, under our right, our right cheek. So that means that that entire, if you wanted to make her face as chubby as it was on one side, you had to remove that inner cheek. You know, so just follow what Portrait Studio is showing you. If we go into the exact same angle and build the reference exactly as we need it, we just have to get rid of that. We have to deflate or inflate that cheek just like that. <laughs> okay. That was so mature. <clears throat> the outline of the last contour is visible. Yes. It becomes the edge. The last contour line is the outline. And if you don't understand it, I think you will get it. I think it's just, you know, when we, when you first learn about something, it's kind of alien to you and you don't get it. But after a couple of days, your brain just understands it on its own. You say to your brain, hey, forget about it, but your brain's still there trying to calculate everything and figure out exactly what was happening. And think about it again a couple of days after. Um, and you're like, oh, I get it now. Yes, it's link time. Start linking away. So if you liked what you saw today and uh, you want to stay connected, if you want to join in on the environment challenge, please go to istabrak.com and go to the community tab. You'll find everything you need here. The witch's hovel is basically you just sketching away and trying to design a just uh, along the description in the resource pack. And um, it's due on the 30th of August. And I'll look at them then. Start sketching. You guys need to start sketching and start dressing your environments with real content. Um, if you want to purchase Purchase Studio, just go to the store. It's available there. Its current price is the lowest it'll ever be um, before the update that's coming up by the end of the summer. We're working really hard to update everything and make it perfect and just maximize the quality of the models. Uh, there will be full body motion. There will be posable hands. Uh, there will also be a zoom up on the portrait. Um, with hands, uh, I mean, it's just, I can't wait to pose those hands because you know I, I love doing portraits and I love doing that whole bust thing so I can't wait to use it myself as well. Um, there will be a completely new UI, a lot more, um, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but I guess user friendly um, sliders and uh, it's just going to look better. It's also going to, uh, there's also has been, there, there have been many crashes. So um, the Unity, who is basically, we use Unity uh, develop, to develop the program, they basically have this issue on their end, and they've recently released, they're, rele they're releasing a patch soon that will hopefully fix that crashing. So if you own Portrait Studio and it's crashing, other developers who also use Unity have also been crashing for the same reason. So it's not our coding, it has nothing to do with our part, but please, if you do have some random errors, just report them, just send them in and uh, uh, report the errors that you find. Uh, just go to the store and scroll down and you'll be able to have a place to report the exact um, error code that you get and so we'll be able to fix it. But mostly everyone who has been reporting an issue, it's because of Unity, it's not because of us and hopefully they fix it soon. Um, so yeah, get sketching. I can't wait to see what you guys make and uh, I will see you guys on Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you everyone for watching. Have a great day guys. Bye-bye.